Dear fellow pilots friends, ACAO Centro Volo Nordest and Postumia welcome you to this evening. My name is Pier Fassina, I'm a glider pilot from the Enemonzo Gliding Center in the northeast side of Italy. I'm very glad to have organized this event about Slovenia and Croatia web flying. As you may have seen from the last flights in recent months, our Slovenian friend and of the Aeroclub Postumia made a fantastic flight. For this reason, we asked them for a collaboration in order to share everything they learned about. Bernard, Sandy, and Luca kindly agreed to introduce us to this particular phenomenon in this particular territory, so we can understand all the mechanisms in order to replicate these flights. During the organization of this evening, I had the opportunity to speak with several top Italian pilots, and I must say that all of them show a lot of interest in this area, which remains a bit little known for us Italians. I'm happy to start this interesting evening and to introduce our friend Aldo Cernezzi, who will be our moderator tonight. I also want to remember to all of you that on 21 of February, we have arranged a fantastic webinar with my friend Eric Reynolds, the inventor of the solar glider Sunsic 2. Eric also is with us tonight because he told me it's very interesting about wet life in Slovenia. So remember 21 of February at 21 Italian time, same link. I want also to share to thanks to all my friends who helped me to set up this event. They are Alessandro Busco, Andrea Venturini, Viviano Ongaro, Davide Cescato, Manuele Molinari, Margherita Quaderni, Alberto Sironi, Jean-Marie Clement, and of course, the moderator of this webinar, Aldo Cernetti. Let's begin, my friend. Thank you. Aldo. Hi, everybody. Ciao, buonasera a tutti. I'm glad to be here. Thank you, uh, Centro Volo Vela Nordest, uh, Charlie Victor, November Echo, Ene Monzo, a great club with a lot, a lot of great initiatives. Uh, during the pandemic, we spent many evenings uh, watching and participating in seminars uh, organized by the Charlie Victor, November Echo Club. A fantastic young, small, but very active club in Italy, in the northeastern part of Italy. Uh, our um, panelists tonight are Sandy Cavalitz, I hope I say it correctly, and Bernard Dobre. Um, Bernard Dobre is very young, he's 21 years old, a uh, Venturani, Bernard. He has about 800 gliding hours and he is a, a student in mechanical engineering. While about Sandy, uh, Sandy Kavalic is uh, 36 years old, flies in the Aero Club of Postoina and works as a risk manager, lavora nella gestione del rischio a 36 anni. Uh, his passion is big data analysis and is using his knowledge, passion and skills also for the analysis in cross country and in competition flying. Sandy is practicing the soaring sport already for 10 years and has international and national competition gliding experience more than 1,000 flight hours and uh, yes, his uh, longest flight uh, up today was uh, from Namibia, Kiripoti. But he loves alpine flying and wave flying mostly. He is one of the partners in the ownership of uh, the new Duo Discus equipped with uh, FES front electric sustainer together with Luca Znidarsic, who is also taking part in this meeting tonight. And we all know Luca Znidarsic as the um, uh, maker, producer, uh, 
uh, of the FES system, which is a huge success for- Maybe, maybe I ask, uh, I ask uh, Luca, uh, Sandy and uh, Bernard to turn on the video. Yeah, so we can see them. Uh, Sandy, Bernard and Luca, please turn on the video. Sandy mentions uh, the mentorship by Bastian uh, Rudolf, another Slovenian pilot. And uh, so they made uh, a 600 kilometer flight on the coast before the incredible 1300 kilometer flight performed by Luka Nidarsic with Bernard Dobre. Uh, I think I said too many things in Italian, just a few words. I due piloti hanno uno 21 anni, Bernard, e 36 Sandy. Il loro mentor è stato Bostian Rudolf e sono... Sandy è un comproprietario del duo discus uh, FES, il primo esemplare equipaggiato con FES, insieme a Luca Znidarsic, che ne è anche l'installatore, il produttore del sistema di motorizzazione. Per quanto mi riguardo ho finito. I think I have finished with my introduction of the panelists tonight. I hope everybody enjoys tonight's presentation by Sandy Kavalic and uh, Bernard Dobre. Thanks. We're starting. Uh, we, we have a, a few, um, um, the agenda of the evening is made of six parts. We will also speak about oxygen management, which is extremely important for safety in uh, high altitude flying. Uh, we will go into details of the location, presentation of the planning, and then we will, uh, the, our panelists will describe the emotions and the practical parts of the flight. So it's up to you. Thank you. Eh, eh, Alberto, Una Alberto. nota tecnica giusto okay. per le domande. Eh, se come al solito okay. questo è un webinar, quindi domande le potete fare attraverso il modulo domande e risposte che si chiama anche question and answer per le versioni in inglese. Eh, in modo tale che tutti i panelist possano vederle e poi vi risponderanno probabilmente eh, a voce, in parte forse anche per iscritto. Quindi domande non attraverso la chat, ma attraverso il modulo question and answer, eh, Aldo. Um, yeah, a reminder by Alberto that this is a webinar, so the panelists are leading the event and the public, the participants may chat between each other or send the hello on the chat line. But if you want to ask questions, there is a special button at the, at the probably at the lower part of your, uh, of your screen in the Zoom presentation. And that is called in Italian domande e risposte, or if you have the English version, Q and A, questions and answers. So you may write your question, potete scrivere la vostra domanda in italiano o in inglese, in English or Italian. I will keep an eye on it and I will uh, generally keep the questions for the end of the presentation, but if I find it necessary, I will, I, I, I will share it with our panelists. Thank you. What is FES was the first question. It's a front electric sustainer, the electric motor mounted in the nose cone of many gliders today and powered by batteries in uh, the fuselage, which allows for sustainer flight, sustained flight, not self-launching except on very small gliders. Now I'm finished. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Aldo, uh, Alberto, Pierre. Um, nice hello to everyone. Um, um, I propose that we start, but I think you should first start stop sharing that I can share the presentation. Um, can you say again what you were suggesting? You have to start Pierre Fax, Pierre Fax, uh, chiudi la condivisione dello schermo della copertina. Okay, now you can share. Okay, thank you. So uh, again, a uh, nice hello uh, to everyone. Um, so today presentation 
Um, hopefully you'll see it. We'll be on the on the way flying from Postoina. Uh, the topic yep. uh, I think would be quite interesting. It's a long presentation, so um, be comfort in your seat. Um, take some 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 water for drinking, and hopefully you will be you will be not bored by this presentation. Um, um, so the agenda for today, we will start with the introduction and presentation of the area, uh, the first uh, flights and explorations. Uh, we will go then to more technical part, meteorological conditions for waves uh, in Slovenia and Croatia. Uh, this is something really important uh, for you to be to to identify the good conditions for wave flying in this region. We will touch a little bit about the specifics and maybe also the um, why these flights are quite technical and uh, quite uh, demanding and challenging. Um, We'll go to a little bit to the soaring tactics and a little bit we will present you the tips that are helping us to, to, to do these flights. And then uh, he will have some discussions. He will have, a, let's say, a pause here uh, for a discussion. And uh, then um, Bernard will take over um, more relaxed part of the today's presentations. Um, so what equipment was used, the preparation, and also we have a, a host uh, um, Jean-Marie will, will present the specifics of, uh, of uh, DS and oxygen because it's really important to be really um, to, to know the specific and be really prepared for such flights. Uh, then Bernard will, uh, will also present you the, what, were you, what were you, we are thinking about the future possibilities and the potential we have here for long cross-country flights and we present you this amazing flight uh, um, of uh, 1300Ks. So um, let's go to the, to, the, to the presentation of the area. How everything started, um, you have to know that uh, I'm driving every day from, from coast of Slovenia to Ljubljana. It's a center part of Slovenia. So I'm every day going by this region. And uh, these are the photos that were taken from, if you, if you write in Google search, um, lenticularis cloud and velvet area in Croatia, you will get these photos. And it's a uh, quite amazing wave. Uh, and we, are, we were observing it for, let's say, some 20, some, some 10 years. And um, this is our inspir inspiration and we were really, to, to try these waves. So that was a lot of talking in our club, how to, how to tackle this challenge. Uh, and we do a lot of analysis. Um, um, I have some more pictures. Um, um, and and, um, and what was the, the main challenge here? And what, what is the main challenge in this part of, of the wave? And um, the, the, it's, it's the challenging terrain. So I took um, a map from um, CU Cloud, and it's uh, and I turn on the Skyways uh, layer, and you can see a lot of this this area where we are flying mostly. Um, so is this uh, this part in Italia, and you know the Austrian uh, part and um, and and valley, and you have a lot of uh, sky uh, sky um, skyways here, but if you look at the Croatian coast. Um, and down to down to the south, you can see that there are not so many pets. There are some here at uh, at uh, Rijeka. These are some paragliders, uh, and some here in Buzea Tuchka. This is the part, but there are no many flights. And this is and mainly because the terrain here is quite challenging. This is the karst terrain. Uh, there are not so many outlanding possibilities, and uh, also because. Um, um, Let's say um, you have uh, you, you have to know the, the, the area and also some conditions that then Bernard will present. Uh, but what was the the let's say the trick important, the changing part of and why we started now with these long flights? Um, I think is two or three things. Uh, the first one is the, we equipped all the gliders with transponders. 
we started to use the flight plans uh, and started to quite nicely collaborate with the flight controllers. And uh, we do all the analysis and also the, the prediction models. And I'm talking about the sky side. It's really amazing. So this was the this was the pivoting point why we are nice now starting to uh, more and more intensively explore this area. But I have to start at the beginning. And in 2003, Matija Kodrić is a local pilot. Uh, Use this wave to, to, to set a national height record of 7,004 uh, meters. And when I when I picked the photos from, from that time, I was amazed how similar the conditions were. If, if you, and Bernard will present some pictures and also from um, my flight with uh, Bastian, we have quite same uh, uh, conditions. So it's really amazing, um, um, and it, this is really important. And it's um, it's it's uh, saying and telling us that th these conditions are predictable, and this is important. Uh, nevertheless, uh, Luca Luca tried uh, last year and uh, set the national record at seven thousand uh, six hundred meters, and uh, and uh, tried. Um, not just going um, high, but also in, in um, let's say, in some cross country to south direction. Um, but you have to know that uh, this area is not just nice for the wave flying. Um, many years ago and many times, um, Alash, Alash Marash performed the thermal flights of uh, 600 and more kilometers with uh, Nimbus 3. Uh, so this is in these thermal flights of the summer are really something um, nice and beautiful. And there are a lot of many flights from Bosnia and uh, Livno and uh, Croatia seen um, from, from uh, Bustian and um, other um, amazing pilots. On the wave, I have to point out uh, one first, um, let's say, inspirational cross country flight from Klaus Solman. It was 514 kilometers. He, he did the first exploration here. Um, um, and then me and Bastian, um, 600 kilometers, and uh, Bernard and Luca, this amazing uh, uh, flight. Um, on this picture, because it's so nice comparison of the two flights, uh, I would like to point out one thing. This I, I would I try to present the direction of the flight. So this is the direction of uh, of the nose of the sailplane, um, and um, you can see quite different angle because the wind speed difference was um, here. Me and Bustian had. Uh, 130 to 140 kilometer per hour, and Luca and Bernard more around uh, 80, 90. So this is also the difference. And uh, um, in in these flights, um, and uh, this this um, flying direction also affects the the cross country speed and the kilometers. Okay, so. Um, a little bit about our um, airfield. It's a Club Postoina. Um, here is the link. You can you can um, you can have a look. We have a quite nice uh, uh, web page. It's a small airfield, um, and, I, and this is the photo from the from the from the fly because uh, I wanted to point out here how cold it was. In this cold weather, the inversion we have is. Uh, um, something that is a it's a prerequisite for these um, wave conditions, and you can see the canopy of the of the dual discus. It's covered in ice. Um, uh, when we took it out of the trailer, it just uh, freezed. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's a 750 meters long runway. It's grass. Uh, and it's quite nice airfield. We we have quite nice restaurant if you if you go. Um, to Croatia, you have to stop and um, um, 
there is quite nice uh, people and have quite nice um, flying uh, activity here. So it's a it's it's a nice uh, it's a nice uh, nice nice airfield and nice club. Um, so a little about more in detail of the region here and the wave uh, um, wave that we have. I wanted to stress out these four um, four wave regions, and you have to know that uh, Postoyan airfield is here at the beginning, but I'll present it uh, more detail later on. So this is the first region, uh, just that you can imagine and uh, you you are you get familiar with the region when Bernard also we present the flight. Here is the Lirska Bistrisa and Risniak region. This is the first uh, strong uh, wave. Then you have a little bit of a transition to Velebit. And here you have the, the this wave is one of the strongest one. Uh, also because uh, reach is more defined and uh, um, because of the quite nice uh, slope and conditions here. And then we have two possibilities. One is more to, to, to the Makarska and Sin. This is one way to, to, to go. And uh, one, the ad, one other possibility that we have when transitioning from the Belebit wave, it's more this Dinara Limno region. So these are the both possibilities. And uh, you will see later on in the pictures, it's quite nicely marked and you can decide whatever you want to do and to, wherever you want to, to, to fly to. Um, so what's what's important here? Um, it's the transitioning levels. Uh, let's say, and uh, I have to do the disclaimer here. We are just uh, at the beginning of the exploration of this area, so there will be more flights for sure, and there will be more information later on. Uh, but for now, uh, we we think that the best thing, uh, the best uh, way to transition from these two waves is. Um, above uh, 4,000 meters and transitioning from Belevit to, to, to Dinara, here is the Knin, it's uh, better to be a little bit higher. Um, um, let's say 5,500 on a Belevit to this direction and back. I want to stress out here uh, that we, we, we have some really important um, airfields here that can be used as a, a landing points and are close to these transitions. So one is uh, Zadar and Sin on this part, maybe split a little bit, uh, um, a little bit uh, maybe too far away. But if you go to see Makarska, uh, you, you have also Sin and split possibilities. Uh, why, are these, uh, why are these points good and good to know? And, um, and because when we are transitioning, on Velebit, this is the strongest wave. We have the nice possibilities to, to land here. And um, for some that uh, are sailing in Croatia, um, and I, I, I sailed a lot uh, with a sailing boat there, I know that there are quite rough uh, conditions when Bora is, uh, is, uh, is uh, blowing in this part. But it gets better and better when you go to the south. And the Zadar split, uh, it's a little bit better. So if we don't have this strong wind of 140 km per hour, it's, um, it's, 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 it's landable. And also the direction of the uh, airfield, it's quite nice to the wind. Nevertheless, I. Sandy, this is Aldo. Sorry. Are these international airports? Or yes, they are. Traffic? Thank you. Yes, they are. Um, so, um, but uh, I have to stress out that we are also exploring the, some outfields, but I will not uh, I will not present them yet because we have to do our homework. Um, and when we do our homework, for sure, there will be in some databases uh, on Stecken Fluke and, um, and elsewhere. So, yeah. These are these are these important uh, points. Uh, there were a lot of uh, there were a lot of discussion. What kind of ways uh, are here? And also, uh, Jean Marie uh, presented us that most probably is um, it's um, hydraulic jump. But uh, 
we have to do some flights and some research to 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 confirm. Um, we'll see. The time will say what conditions are. Maybe there are, maybe there are more conditions and more kind of wave. Um, but for sure, uh, SkySight is predicting them really well. And also, you saw the picture in the in the at the start. So the lenticular clouds are really amazing, and that's important for us. Um, so I will go more in details of uh, meteorological conditions, um, and it's it's a kind of preparation that we have uh, and what we are looking and um, um, and what we are searching for 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 this wave uh, flights and the conditions we have. Um, I took a picture from um, um, from Marco Koroshets. He's a quite nice um, storm chaser, uh, nice guy. Um, and um, this picture was it, it 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 says this picture is uh, pointing that maybe there is a hydraulic jump because we have quite nice laminar air here, and then you, you will see a lot of uh, waving uh, uh, from one uh, from one point on. Uh, what I want to stress out is because of the cover here, um, there is a lot of cold air, and this cold air is the the um, makes the condition and the inversion uh, for the waving. Um, but um, you have to know that there is quite severe turbulence before um, below 600 meter, meters uh, above ground, so um, this is something to be aware of. And uh, these are the the this is the tricky part or challenging part uh, in this in this uh, in this area. Um, so what we are looking for um, um, for we are looking looking for the anticyclone um, in central part of Europe. But even better is if we have a cyclone on the on on the Greek um, region or let's say in this uh, Balkan, South Balkan region, it, it's even better. And when we have this um, um, anti-cyclone, we have quite nice and um, predictable wind that is um, lasting from two to three days, four maybe. Um, and uh, when this anti-cyclone is progressing, it's getting better, 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 and then uh, and then it's uh, no wave anymore because the, wave, um, the wind goes uh, um, uh, changes the direction too much. And what is nice? Sorry. E ogni quanto si presenta questa condizione? È una condizione frequente uh, o è molto rara? So uh, Alberto asked if um, this is uh, something that is uh, predictable and, and the frequency is high or it's uh, more um, or, or it's less frequent. Um, it's quite it's quite free, frequent in the in the in the winter. Uh, let's say one to two times per month. It could be that we have these um, um, uh, conditions, but it's not. So much predictable as other waving sites, no sites um, around the world. So, so, the so the frequencies is similar to the north wind in the Alps, more yes, or less. Yes, and this is really uh, good that you pointed out, Alberto, because when we are uh, our gliding community in Slovenia, where we have the channel and we start talking, and the dilemma is if we go on the wave. Or if we go to to Omaribor on the northern north uh, north wind slope soaring, um, and when this wave uh, is um, when we have the conditions for the wave, we have also many times the conditions for the north wind. Okay, thank you. Um, and let's try to remember this conversation with Alberto because uh, Bernard will present uh, some some um, daring flying ideas um, for, for, for cross-country flights later on. So the source is, of course, SkySight. Um, it's amazing how precise it is. Um, um, but we have also quite nice local um, uh, national weather uh, agency that is preparing all the um, prognosis. Um, I put all uh, both the, the the links here, and uh, we have special 
a special site um, dedicated to, to, to flying and also special to um, soaring. And what is important here is the measured uh, vertical sounding. Um, and why this is important? Because before we go on the wave flying and we, we are relying on the prognosis from SkySight, you have to check the sounding. So you, this is really important that you check that the vertical profile of the wind is similar and also the temperature uh, profile is similar as in a prediction model. If you check that, you, you have more chances and, um, and the reliability of the prognosis and the model is really high. So this is uh, first thing in the morning to do is check if the uh, measured sounding is similar or the same as in the prognosis. And, if did, and this confirms that uh, the prognosis, it's, uh, it's correct. Uh, otherwise, I can point out um, an experience I had uh, with Luca when we were flying in Sotoban. Um, we have uh, for 180 degrees um, of phase, was, the, the whole wave was shifted because the wind um, strength was uh, quite different as in the prognosis. But uh, local guys know there uh, in Sotoban that uh, this is the case and uh, the prediction models are exaggerating with the wind. So that also um, they they um, they told us, and uh, we were flying opposite as the sky side uh, was telling us to fly. Uh, so it was let's say 300 meters of or 400 meters of difference in, in the wavelength. Okay, so what was really interesting about the two flights was the nice condition we have at the start. So at the airfield Postoina, there was almost no wind at the ground. And, and this is something also we are looking because if there is too much wind, it's too risky and it's too turbulent. Uh, so we are, um, we are deciding upon also what wind is blowing on the Pastoina uh, airfield. And uh, this is the, 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 the profile of the, of the wind. And you can see that it's quite, quite quickly picking up with the height, but to the ground, it was like, a, a, a little breeze, uh, not, not so much uh, strong wind. Um, so the takeoff was really easy. Um, nice, no, no bumping, no, no turbulence. Um, but the conditions I took from Sen, so this is the, uh, the region to, 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 to Belebit and uh, later on, here is known that uh, the, the, the wind is quite strong. Um, and this is also pointing out that the wave conditions here are better than in Postoina. So it's a little bit hard to start in Postoina. Uh, you have to have quite a high air tow. We are towing uh, up to 1,200, maybe also to 2,000 meters sometimes. I think the flight of Luca and Bernard was uh, quite, had a quite high starting point. Um, but uh, it, it, it's a nice uh, towing. It's not nothing turbulent or to be scared of. Um, and why I'm pointing this out? Um, because you can see here on the picture, the sea is uh, sprinkling. So you have a lot of moisture in the air and this is because the Bora wind is, uh, is gusty here. So there's a lot of gusts and it's, uh, it's uh, picking up the water. Uh, so whoever sailed here in Bora knows what I'm talking about, and that's why it's quite uh, difficult to land in on, on, on the on the islands. There are some airfields, but I would not advise to go there. And this is also something important to be really careful not to be blown uh, behind uh, behind the, the wave. So this is the the picture to the south, um, and you have to to stay on the on the front uh, front side. Uh, of the wave. So inversion, I started with an inversion in Postoina uh, and you can see it was not so strong. Then if we go to the south, it's getting stronger and more defined. And, uh, and uh, um, in, in Triban, it was quite uh, strong. So why I'm, uh, why I'm pointing this out 
it's also because I, I did the, the, let's say the, the profile um, of the wave. So from here to here, and you can see at Postoina it was uh, just uh, 0.7 meter per second. And more you go to the south, more the wind was picking up, more the vertical sounding for, for the profile of the temperature was uh, um, defined, the more the, the more the strength of the wave. Uh, so this is also Eidushina. This is really important because we have two starting points. One is from Postoina to the south, but we have quite nice position also a little bit to the north, maybe it's uh, 15 kilometers to the north, it's Eidushina. And here, sometimes we have more um, or better conditions. Uh, because the slope is more defined and also the cold air that is uh, uh, coming, uh, it's, it's, and the, the inversion is a little bit better. So this is also a starting point. So me and Bustian for the 600 flight started from, we were air towed to the Eidushina, to the north. And then this was our starting point. Luca and Bernard, uh, as Bernard will present later on, started on the south. And when we go, uh, if you go to the south, to the Seine, uh, you can see the strength and the height of the, of the wave. Here is uh, 11,000. Uh, 11, um, uh, so this is the wave. And then we go to the Velebit one. So Triban, you can see here, three, four meters per second and uh, up to 12,000. Uh, uh, and um, when you're flying this wave, it's really, it's strong one. Uh, you have to pick up the speed, otherwise uh, you cannot, uh, you cannot um, fly um, in this flight level 1502200 because it's so strong that uh, you, have to, you have to speed up to, up to VNA. And if you go more to the south, to that region I presented you before, so it's um, here is split. Uh, later on, Makerska, here is um, this uh, Bosnian part and uh, Luno. You can see it's really, it's even stronger. And it's strong from, let's say, 1,500 up to 11. So really nice wave. Um, and it's not just the height and the strength, it's also the lengthness uh, that is uh, quite nice. Um, and it's allowing to, 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 to do this, uh, these uh, long flights. So here is the, here is the prognosis, 6.5. But when you are flying this uh, wave, is, it, was, it was around 5.5, really strong wave. Okay, so what are the, what are the little bit of uh, the specifics and uh, what, uh, what is the, um, the shape of this wave? So here I pointed Postoina airfield and the two waves. So this is the Northern part um, that we are looking at the, at the East. Uh, this is the East direction. So we are looking at the Aiduschina starting point and we are looking at the, let's say Ilirska Bistrica starting point, maybe 15 kilometers uh, or to 20 kilometers from Postoyan airfield. Um, and this is the amazingness we have. So here is the Postoyna. We are, the airfield is at the starting point. You saw the, the vertical profile and the no wind uh, on the ground. So easy takeoff. And then the wave, this, this one, um, and then Bosnia uh, up, to, up, to, up to Montenegro. Uh, this is really something um, important. Uh, with the height, the, the, the wave is more and more moving to, 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 the, to the wind. Um, so another profile of these waves. Um, and unfortunately, sky side, uh, you have to change the, the, the model or, or the, the region. So I also took from the south, here is the Makarska. Uh, split is here, and then you can see, you can see Montenegro uh, and the waving just continues to the south. Um, so the possibilities here is Nikšić. So the possibilities uh, are really really amazing. Um, um, so Bernard and Luca did uh, this um, let's say 
um, twice the lag, but I think the out and return flights could be um, could be quite uh, quite amazing. And uh, this is the picture uh, of this uh, from um, of, of this uh, wave, and you can see that it's really nicely um, visible the rotorous clouds. So it's not uh, so hard to fly it, even though there are no ridiculous clouds. It was quite dry at the upper levels. I think both flights of the Lucas and Bernard was a little bit uh, more drier, uh, but nevertheless, there there were a lot of um, a lot of markings and the the. Uh, Sandy, from yes. Um, the picture we are looking at now mm -hmm. shows the heading of the glider uh, uh, quite a lot to the left, but I guess you are following the leading edge of the rotors, isn't it? Yes. This was so that, the. That's your crab angle because you, you had more than 100 kilometers per hour. You had about 130 kilometers per hour wind, which is 70 knots. That's yes. Correct. Yeah, okay. that, that is correct. And also, that I, I presented it on that uh, comparison uh, of the sure. flights uh, with, with our arrows. Uh, 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 already, uh, I want to use this small interruption to tell you that the evening is a big success. We have 149 participants some of them from uh, other continents. So congratulations. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, um, and this is, uh, uh, this is another picture. Uh, it's from Knin, when uh, Aybush Tian just, uh, just um, tried this wave. And uh, this, was the, this was the continuation of Luca and Bernard. So we turned back here, but Luca and Bernard uh, went on this wave to the south. And you can see you have a uh, um, quite nice waving first, secondary, tertiary. Here is the Makerska. Um, so, but this is the this is the most stronger from Knin to the south. This is the most stronger wave. Okay, a little bit about uh, soaring tips. Um, so the first tip is start early. Me and Bastian prepared the glider in the morning, and this was a mistake. We start at, uh, I don't know, at um, nine. We, we threw away two hours of flight, I think. And uh, Bernard and uh, Luca did, uh, did something better. They, they, and we helped the ring the glider the day before. So this is really important to start early. Um, so this is something also really important to check the sounding. Um, so this is in Slovenian, it's verticalna sondaža here at this page. I, I, I put the link uh, previously. Um, and sometimes you are a little bit earlier than, than, than this uh, sounding presentation. And what I'm looking at, and it's not just from Ljubljana, you have also from uh, Zadar, you have this uh, radio sounding info. And you have all, this, all the sites uh, um, and you can check in real time, the sounding. These are the sounding balloons that are released uh, every morning on some sites even uh, more frequently during the day. And you can observe the wind direction and you can observe the temperature. So this is something to maybe um, nice to have and nice to know. Um, so the, the, the really important part of the wave is the, is the, is, is the temperature profile. And uh, what we are observing that we have, um, let's say the, the fog. So the fog is, is telling us that there is uh, inversion condition. And the fog, this is, uh, I think this was uh, starting of uh, Ljubljana Valley. So, um, and this is the, from Aiduschina picture. And then this is when we return back, this is Snežnik. It's uh, a little bit south of the Pustojna, and you can see the Ljubljana Valley also at the end of the day and the whole day, it was uh, quite strong and nice inversion in mainland. And this is something important, and it's telling you that the, there are conditions, there is not fogging, fogging, uh, fog um, fading, because if it's fading, there's a lot of uh, solar radiation and could be hitting the ground and, uh, and uh, disrupting the wave conditions. So this is something that we are observing uh, during the fly, especially. Yeah. Sorry. Just let me interrupt you as one second. Uh, occasionally, when you show a slide 
which includes um, a URL link for, to, for meteo information or anything else. Usually I visit that page and I copy the URL address in the chat line. So if any, anybody wants to check the chat line, you will find the, the links published on, uh, on the screen. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sandy. Go ahead. OK. Um, sorry, I'm not so used to use this, but yeah. No, uh, absolutely. Very presentation. You are, you uh, are yeah, doing yeah. very well. And I, ah, I, okay, I, okay. I try to add something for our participants. Um, yeah, and what is really nice, uh, it's also the cover. And if there are a lot of uh, cloud cover in the mainland, it's, uh, it's the same as with the fog. You know, there is not so much solar radiation. There, is, um, there are conditions for the, for the uh, inversion uh, lasting all the day. And this is also something uh, really important to observe. Uh, here you can see the instrument and the sky side. But Bernard will present you a little bit. So yeah, the tip five, um, if you check in the morning that uh, the, the, the wind is uh, the same as uh, prognosed um, and um, also the inversion is the same, I, I can tell you that you, you, could, you, can, um, you can rely on sky side. It's really precise. It's a mathematical model um, and it, it, it's an amazing work from Matthew and his team. Um, you can see also the transitions in green and uh, the, the IGC file is um, um, marked red here with, uh, with um, um, rising. Um, and I, I wanted to present you how precise the sky site is here. So this is when this is a flight from me and uh, this is when we turn back. I uh, remember the photo before. But the question is why you turn back in this <laughs> point? Because it, it looks like uh, is the best way to go south. Yes, uh, Alberto, it was because we have some really important uh, things to do late in the late uh, afternoon. Uh, so we have some family business to do. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, it was the first explorational flight. Uh, we were quite cautious. We were flying high. Uh, when you are flying high, the speed of the wind is so high that uh, it lowers your ground speed. So um, this, is, this is a little bit of a balance and transitioning. If you want to be really quick uh, and fast, you must not go too high because the wind is uh, picking up and it's uh, taking away your ground speed. Uh, but in this slide was just uh, the first exploration of one and we were just enjoying uh, the, the nice views. And what was really important because of the strength of the wind, the length wave was um, quite um, wider. And that's why we have more, um, it, it was the, the flight more above the sea. So it was really above the sea. Um, and also the, the pictures you can see are stunning because we have quite nice views on the, on the Croatian islands. Um, so um, tip six, even though it was dry, there was a lot of uh, markings, a lot of uh, rotor clouds. And that's why how we and how you proceed here, you look at the sky side, you see the rotorous clouds, you try it uh, and it's working, you're just, uh, it, you just uh, go on because it's so so beautifully marked. Um, what's also important, tip seven, the transitions, to the transitions when you have, uh, don't look just of the rising hair. You have to be careful not to transition through sinking hair. This was just uh, to try it out um, uh, because we were really high here. Um, but this is something to avoid. It's better to continue on the wave and then the transition through not so much sinking air. Um, Sandy, what's yes. uh, the actual distance between the wave bar and the red cross you were showing? A few kilometers, maybe? Th this distance? The, the real distance of the, between the wave bar and uh, the cross, the red cross. It's, it's just a few kilometers, I guess. It's one to two kilometers max. Only, yeah. Yes. So big sink is just a couple of kilometers. Yes. The other question I have uh, is, uh, what's your 
mm, maximum allowed altitude. I've seen your flight. You <laughs> rarely went uh, above 6,000 meters. That's flight level 195, I guess. Yes. But uh, th this part will be most in detail presented by Bernard. Maybe, maybe we will uh, jump to this uh, question later on. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> um, so yeah, because of the strong wind, you can see the flying uh, path here above the sea. And this was really nice. Um, but nevertheless, even though it was quite dry, you can see the, the markings. You can see here. It's small, but it's enough to give you the confidence uh, that sky site is correct. Uh, the wave is strong. You are in 4.5 uh, meter per second climb. So um, it's nice. OK, so um, I think this part uh, was uh, all from my side. Uh, from here on, uh, Jean-Marie and Bernard will take over. Um, I propose that we open some discussions and maybe answer some questions. Um, Sandy, somebody was asking um, about the season. I mean, we, we've seen that you took off with the freezing uh, weather, but uh, how is it in the spring and in the summer? What kind of chances to find wave in your region? Uh, little chances. I think the season is from um, October to to March, early March, and then there will be there will be hardly conditions that will be during uh, all the day. So in winter is easy because you have the the sounding and the temperature profile that with, within the inversion that is lasting through the day. Uh, otherwise, I think you there will be some possibilities um, um, in the morning. But uh, not not the whole day. There are some um, there are some conditions on when the south uh, western wind is blowing. Uh, but I doubt that there will be a conditions for so long flights. It's more about uh, it, it's more about the winter season. Yeah? Thank you, Sandy. Probably the Hermas is completely different during the winter when, when uh, uh, in comparison with the summer. And also probably thermals are destroying yeah. the conditions for wave, probably. Yeah, they are, they are. But um, as I presented, uh, but the, the thermal conditions um, on that uh, eastern part of Velovit are, are nice. Uh, so you, I presented you the flight from Alash Marash, and there were also some other pilots, and also from Liuno going uh, to the north and back. Uh, and quite uh, quite long uh, flights. So also the thermic conditions in the summer are quite nice in Croatia. You should check out uh, on the OLC and you will see the from Liuno airfield and Sen, uh, Sin uh, airfield. There are quite nice flights. It is a beautiful airfield and I was flying there in 2012, I think, mm -hmm. uh, in the Livno Adria Cup and I was very happy to be there. We have um, a participant asking if you have ever thought about crossing the Adriatic Sea tailwind and reaching Italy. Um, it was not me. Um, there were some other pilots from Zelian. The, the makers of Felix uh, 9000, we have some conversation about that, uh, how to cross the, and there are ideas also for that, yeah. Ah, that's great, Erasm probably. Erasm, yeah. Okay. I have a conversation with Erasm um, and uh, these uh, nice ideas, yeah. Great, keep us posted. <laughs> we'll see. So please go ahead. Is it time for uh, yes for Bernard? Yeah, it's Bernard turn. So thank you. Bernard, and, uh, you're welcome. I will join later. Okay. Oh, thank you, Sandy. So let me just share the screen. It's screen. Oh, okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Then let's start. Okay, I will uh, first. I will present sailplane equipment and preparations for those flights. Uh, so sailplane and equipment. Uh, first, it's it's good to fly with great airplane because it's better in strong winds. 
uh, I flew on waves around five or six times, and all the time I flew with DG100 or DG300, and I made a few uh, longer flights, for example, 400 kilometers or 300 kilometers down the coast, and also a height record of 8,000 uh, meters. Uh, but I was always scared to do this and I was always flying extremely high uh, because I was scared that I won't come back because when 140 kilometers of per hour of wind is blowing directly in your nose, uh, your glide ratio is really low, extremely low. Uh, so first, it's good to have great airplane. Here is the duo discus from Sandy and Luca, and here is Bustian, one of our, of our great pilots. And uh, yeah, then it's important to have two independent EDS systems, or it's good to have the, it uh, because it's a great redundancy. If one fails, the other one has uh, the opportunity to fly and to land, and it's much safer. And the other tip is to have flare cannulas. Flare cannulas. Uh, so those are cannulas like this. Uh, that way you can get much more oxygen. And uh, yeah, it's better to have them. And the other thing is transponder. It's mandatory because in Croatia, you can fly uh, only 300 meters above ground without, without transponder. Uh, so you have to have it. It's no other way. Uh, another important part is clothes. Uh, at the altitude where we fly, it's normally extremely cold. Sometimes we fly at minus 40, minus 50 degrees Celsius. Uh, mi minus 50 probably not, but minus 40 is normal. Uh, so you have to uh, to to have as much warm clothes as it's possible, uh, but you have to be cautious not to, to take too much clothes because you still have to uh, take out the landing grip, for example, or uh, take out the air brakes at the landing. So, uh, and also you have to see the how much oxygen you have left. So it's important to, to try it before uh, before the flight to try if you fit in the glider in all those clothes and for example i like to dress a lot for those flights and sometimes i dress like 10 layers and yeah it's it's like i'm an astronaut and another important thing is to have sky boots i haven't used them uh before the flight with luca uh and it it wasn't a great uh, think to not use them because uh, the problem is if you if you have just normal boots uh, and a lot of socks be, be beneath them uh, you have to you still have to uh, have your blood your blood has to run through your feet and if it doesn't you get extremely cold again and it's not it's not good uh yeah so sky boots are great and yeah especially on the front seat on the bed, back seat it's not such a big problem but on the front seat it's it's much better to have them uh, because that way you are not so cold and the next thing is food and also water uh yeah, when you fly at the high altitudes, food can be a problem because everything freezes and it's it's like the the chocolates are like stones and it's not really enjoyable to eat it. Uh, but you, you have to eat something during the whole day. And the other thing is you have to drink water and that might be a problem sometimes because for example, when we flew with Luca, uh, our water uh, froze during the flight because of the low temperatures. And uh, yeah, it, it wasn't really enjoyable to drink a water that was freezing and we were already frozen before. So uh, it wasn't really enjoyable. And the other thing is 
uh, to use oximeter. Uh, that's because you have to you have to know that uh, your uh, your blood saturation is oxygen saturation in your blood is okay. So uh, that's why you have to use oximeter. When I flew to eight thousand meters, I I was checking my uh, my oxygen saturation in the blood all the time, and I only wanted to go as high as this. Uh, because I had more than 95% of oxygen saturation in the blood all the time. So I thought there was a risk, but uh, it was manageable. Bern, uh, 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 about the oxygen, I have also a video um, very interesting from uh, Jean-Marie Clément, a 10 minutes video, so when you want, you, you can tell me, I can show you to everybody. Oh, okay, I think the appropriate, uh, appropriate time it's now. Okay, uh, so. Because uh, I, I was speaking about it. I will do it. Okay, thank you. Wait. In the meantime, I want to ask you something technical regarding the oxygen. Uh, one of the uh, our viewers, uh, other pilots, uh, is pointing out that in uh, the Federal Aviation in America requires a mask from six thousand meters. Uh, do you find that the uh, cannulas are okay, even if it's higher, uh, six, seven thousand meters, uh, Bernard? Oh uh, yes, it's it's the cannulas are okay, and I think there might be explanation in this video. And also the the problem with the with the mask is that you have to communicate with the air traffic controller all the time, and if you don't have a microphone in the mask, that might be a problem. Uh, so yeah, and also. Yeah, I wanted to use the cannulas uh, at that height, and I I know it's safe. So, uh, can I yeah. can I give an additional answer? Yes, please. I'm not an expert yes. on this. Never, area. never, never use the face mask. The requirement from FAA in the USA is purely administrative. If the face mask is wasting fifty percent of the oxygen which is delivered. It doesn't go into your lungs. So cannula, 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 nothing else. Okay, go okay. ahead. I'm ready. I'm ready with the video. Go, go. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to tell you in a few minutes what to do and what not to do with oxygen when flying high altitude and wave. Uh, this works has been made by me, Dr. Schaffner, and the High School of Engineering of Winterthur and the Swiss Army. So these results are in my book, Dancing with the Wind, and uh, many, many other things to do. So first of all, hypoxia is not like a car running of fuel. It may damage the machine. You may get a blood clotting very easily, thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, I had È fermato qualcosa. What happens? Alberto? Uh, the right heart Dimmi. also can be damaged. The, with a... Dimmi, Aldo. Alberto, si era fermato il video per un po', è ripartito e adesso è fermo di nuovo. Okay. The... Okay. Pulmonary oh, vasoconstriction, oh. hypertension, pulmonary edema with inflammatory reaction. This happens quite often. Your nerve system, brain, can be damaged with cell membrane hyperfluidization, brain swelling, nerve and brain edema. Kidneys and adrenal glands can also be damaged with arterial hypertension, I have one, kidney diseases, APO release. Hypertension can also happen, cerebral and retinal, I had one, retinal. And Last but not least, 
we just found that we, there is an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. So enjoy now and pay later. No, zero tolerance. This must be your rule. Zero tolerance on hypoxia. So let's see how the EDS is working. Uh, this is a typical cycle of brief, 20 brief per minute. That means three seconds from here to here. In the first uh, half of the first second, so in this part, 500 milliseconds, the oxygen which goes into your lung go really to the alveola and are really used by your body. All the rest is completely wasted. This part, the second part of the brief, is lost because the oxygen does not reach the alveola, but it stays in the dead volume, the dead space in your, in your mouth or in, in the tubes. In these parts, you are just expiring, so it's just completely lost. So if you look at what happens here, this is a constant flow system, so most of the oxygen is lost. If you look at the EDS, how it works, you have a small pulse at a flow of 15 liters per minute which longs maximum 500 milliseconds. When the EDS is on manual position, RM, it, it opens here and closes here. You cannot put more oxygen in your lungs but putting more oxygen in your mouth. It's very clear. This is the maximum you can get. So remember, the EDS is working only half a millisecond maximum time. We also measured the flow of uh, oxygen, that means the, the volume of oxygen which is given in, a, in time in all the positions of the EDS O2D1. It's not the last one, it's the one five, ten years ago. But anyway, it's the same, it is the same principle. So, in blue you have the N position, which is the normal position you start with, and then you increase with 5, 10, 15 and 20. And this is the RM, that means reserve manual position. As you can see, the, the, the manual position is always giving the same flow of oxygen, from the ground to any, t any altitude. But what is important to remember, to find here, is that the maximum altitude you can get is 6,000 meters. After 6,000 meters you have no more oxygen. And you need to put the oxygen in F20 or F15 to get the maximum flow. If you don't do that, you will be here. So you will not have enough oxygen at 6,000 meters. So the position N, which is what we call normal, is to be forgotten. Just forget. Let's see now what happens in flight. We have made an experimentation with the help of the Swiss Army. We took six glider pilots in a PC-6 to 6,000 meters by steps of 1,000 meters. And we were adapting the settings of the ADS to maintain 90% minimum SPO2. SPO2 means uh, peripheral saturation. This is the one you measure on your finger. It's not the one you have in your brain. Take care. We, of course, we made a laboratory experimentation before, but it's not sufficient because in flight you are cold, there are vibrations, you have to do some things. So we took the PC-6 and we took six glider pilots in different conditions, young ones, old ones, smokers, non-smokers. The, the, the curve I will show you now is the one of the, a male, 69, so it's not so old, non-smoker with a body mass index of 26.3, which is quite good. 1.72 meter high and 78 kilo. 
the measurements were made with a recording pulse oximeter that I strongly recommend that you use. I do not recommend to use the low-cost uh, digital pulse oximeter for many reasons, but mainly first because you need to protect your finger against light. So you have this, it, it must be protected against cold, so you need a glove, and then you can re replay your flight after after the flight and see what happened, why did I do this mistake? And then you know why. It's because of hypoxia. So this is the most interesting experimentation. <coughs> we, as you can see, we, fl we took off at 3 o'clock and then it took uh, approximately one hour to reach 6,000 meters by steps of 1,000 meters. At each step we were measuring the saturation. So th this is the saturation. The minimum saturation we accepted was 88, but you should not accept less than 90 because you are a pilot. Here, the, 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 the guinea pigs were sitting in a plane and doing nothing. If you are a pilot you need 90 absolutely minimum. So during the first part up to 2,500 meters, you, you see that the saturation is decreasing. And in order to keep 88%, we had to increase the setting to F5. Then the pilot recovered the saturation and then the saturation went down again at 4,000 meters and then we had to increase the setting to F10 and here you can see the flow of oxygen, the duration of a pulse in milliseconds. Good, so we continue the, and the experimentation and the saturation is going down again. So when we were at uh, 5,000 meters we had to go to F20. F20 is the maximum that the ADS can give. And F20 could ensure a good saturation at 6000 meters practically all time. You can see the saturation is 93%, 95. We are at 6000 meters and then we, we stop the experimentation here. So, first conclusion if you are a little old 69, you need to fly with F20 at 6000 meters. And after this, you lose saturation because the EDS does not give any more oxygen. Another very important point the, the piping in your glider has to be made in a certain way if it is a two seater in tandem because the the, the cylinder is on the back, but the length of the pipes has to have to be exactly the same front and back. So you must go to the middle, put a capacity in the middle, and from that capacity go to each ADS in order to have exactly the same length of pipe. If you go is the easy way, which is easy way is go to the back seat and then from the back seat go to the front seat. What will happen? When you breathe from the back seat, the pilot in the front seat receives nothing. That's very dangerous. Anyway, you know that now. Another important point is the pressure in the cylinder. Unfortunately, the low-cost uh, standard XCR regulator from Mountain High does is, is a single step pressure reducer. That means the, the, the output pressure is a function of the input pressure. As you see here, the output pressure is starting to decrease in a dangerous way after 80 bars in the cylinder. If you reach 35, 30 bar, 35 bar in the cylinder, then it drops down drastically and it's dangerous and, and Mountain High knows this 
but didn't tell anybody. We, we discussed, now they agree on that, and they made a two-step pressure regulator that you have to pay a little bit more, but at least you can, you can use up to 35 bar. So remember, when you reach 80 bars in your cylinder, come back home. You have less than one hour of safe operation. This is what I call degraded operation. This is prohibited, simply prohibited. So, there is only one single rule against hypoxia. On the ground, before takeoff, cannula on your nose, ADS operating, a long life is not an option. Thank you for your attention and thanks to Dr. Schaffner and the School of Winterthur. Thank you, Jean-Marie. That was really impressive. Thank you very much. Lots, all, everything is in the book. Information in a few minutes. Uh, Jean-Marie, one of our uh, participants uh, was uh, surprised that you would recommend uh, not using a, a mask against FAA official recommendations. Would you like to explain that? I, I already explained that 10, 15 minutes ago. Yeah. The FAA recommendation is, is a recommendation for administrative reason. They, they never made any experiment and and the, the face mask is something which, like in, a, in, a, in an airline, in a commercial airline, when you have a face mask going down, if you have a, an oxygen failure. But it is very, very dangerous because in a face mask, the, the dead volume is diluting the oxygen you receive. You have a, a pulse of maximum half a second of oxygen. This half a second of, the, of oxygen is diluted into the face mask. And then it, it's yeah. lost for 50% for is lost. The, the only exception of a face mask is when you have the A14 or an A20 um, uh, uh, professional military pilots yeah. because it's pressurized. But oh, yeah, need, that's pressurized, that's right. And if it's pressurized, you need an incredible quantity of oxygen that we do not have. Of course, that's what they use in the Perlan, I think. Uh, Perlan is using another thing. Perlan, no, Perlan is using uh, the, 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 the canopy. The cockpit is pressurized at 6,000 meters and they yeah. use a rebriefer. They recycle, re they, re they recycle what they expire. And then they keep the oxygen, they save the oxygen like this. It's a completely different system. Do you think uh, we should use uh, a special breathing technique like long inspirations and then holding our breath for a couple of seconds more? It's in the book. It's, it is called the pulse. It's a, a, a how do you say, um, what's the name in English? Uh, it's a pursed, pursed lips breathing. So you don't need to inspire a lot because you receive half a second of oxygen. So it's use, useless to, to inspire for a long time. What you get, you get. You cannot get more. Okay, but, thank you. But when you expire, you, you close your mouth and you, you increase the pressure in the lungs. The problem of oxygen is not the quantity of oxygen, it is the pressure. And th this is why you cannot go above, I would say 10 or 11,000 meters around, even if you, if you put oxygen 100% in your lungs, because the pressure is missing, it's not the quantity; it is the pressure. So if you if you if you breathe with the pursed lips, you close your mouth, you increase your pressure. Yes, it works, but 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 it's another problem. You cannot stay more than a few minutes like this because you have to talk to your friend, you have to talk to the radio, you have to eat, to drink. <laughs> you cannot stay for more than a few minutes uh, with a pursed breathing. Thank you, Jean-Marie. Thank and you. It's, it's all, all is in the book. Yeah, yeah you, your book is uh, the Bible of the Bible. Yes, Thank and you. it will be it will be it will be printed in Italian uh, within a few months. Exactly. Um, Okay, uh, so can I continue? Yeah, go yeah, ahead. Sure, of course. Okay, oh, thank you. Oh, uh, Bernard, uh, yeah. another important thing that I didn't mention, it's in the book, but I, I had no time to mention. The, the, the age 
is fundamental. You at 21, you can you can stay at end position at 6,000 meters. Ah, okay, thank yes. you. I cannot. I am dead at 6,000 meters in end position. I lose consciousness. So uh, the, the the older you are, the more oxygen. I need approximately the double of your quantity. I need the double. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Luca, <laughs> if Luca listens to me, he should start thinking about putting more oxygen also. Yeah, we, we had the oxygen uh, at the face mask, mask setting all the time, so we had more than enough oxygen. Okay. And Jean-Marie, I also give your book to Bernard to read it <laughs> before our attempts. Okay. <laughs> Great, great, great. No, okay. Up, apply the rules, please. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so the next thing is the instrument. It's uh, it's a really important part of the preparation uh, because if you have, of course, you can do flights without instruments like this, uh, but it's much easier if you have SkySight integrated on the on your Elix uh, or on your phone with, uh, for example, with CU Navigator, uh, because you can see where the, the waves are calculated. It's uh, the most important is this thing uh, when you are flying in blue conditions. So there are no lenticularis clouds or no rotor clouds. And it happens uh, most of the time, I think. I, I always, only once I've been on the lenticularis cloud uh, and I flew like six times during the last two winters. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's much easier to set those things in a styler uh, because uh, and then download it to, to your uh, instrument. And you have to be careful not to set uh, the clouds, also the layer of clouds overhead this, so because then you won't see uh, vertical velocity at your uh, altitude and also you have to set for different times but yeah if uh, if you will do this i recommend that you check the the other sources because it's it's more technical so yeah it's really useful in the flight that's from sandy's flight uh and you see here he came into the into the area with lifts and it shows him on the instrument. So preparation. Preparation normally starts a few days be before when you see that there is potential option for flying uh, in a few days. And you you check the uh, at least I did I do that. I check the weather a few days before and then i start uh, assembling a team for the for the flying because uh, to to take off during the winter you you have to uh, prepare the airfield so the the potholes on the runway you have to uh, clean them and also you have to assemble a glider a day before because in the morning it's it's not a good thing to do uh, so yeah, uh, normally I come to the airfield one day before and I assemble the glider and I sleep there and I wake up at five o'clock and normally I hit the engine of the towing airplane and uh, prepare the glider. And when the sun, when there is uh, the sun, I, I take off without any problems and without any rush, because if you rush, there is, you always forget something. Uh, and of course, the important thing is to file flight plan. So the air traffic controllers will be happier if you, if you do that on the ground, because if you do that in the air, it takes time and uh, you don't want this. So where is the starting place? It's here, Lima, Juliet, Papa, Oscar. And it's in the middle of the military control zones, uh, but most of the time those zones are, aren't active. And also when they are, they are normally just uh, from nine to five o'clock. So 
it's it's not such big uh, such a big problem and you can normally co coordinate with military so uh it's it's not that big of a problem but of course always check notams for things like this and also for creation airspace uh, so before there was a question about the restrictions of the height. So in Slovenian airspace, uh, the restrictions are from, they are new from 2020. Uh, so up to one flight level 195, uh, it's, it's not a problem to fly there. There are no legal requirements uh, for flying there. Just you, you have to be, of course, it's a controlled airspace, so you have to be, uh, to, you have to be in contact with air traffic control. And then, yeah, from flight level 195 to flight level 285, uh, there are a few uh, mandatory things to have. So the first is appropriate equipment. So you have to have oxygen system, warm clothes, and things like that. Uh, and then it's the the flight plan is necessary. So if you don't file it on the on, on the ground, uh, you have to file it during the the flight with ATC, and you have to be con in the continuous contact with ATC, and you have to have transponder. Uh, it's the best if you have mode Sierra transponder, uh, but I think also mode Charlie is sufficient. And above flight level 285, it's prohib prohibited to fly VFR. So uh, yeah, in our airspace, that's the limit. Uh, but the limit in, in Croatia, I tried to find the restrictions there, but I didn't find any. Uh, and also when I do the, the record flight of 8,000 meters, uh, then the, there was no problem of, of flying higher. But the last time when we flew with Luca, uh, a few con controllers said that uh, the limit is 195, that legally they can't let us fly higher. So I think the, the required, the, the, uh, li the limit is flight level 195, but when I flew there, uh, probably the controllers didn't know that. So they let me fly higher to flight level 265. And uh, yeah. When we flew with Luca, all of them knew about it, except one. Five of them knew, but one didn't. And five of them told us that it's illegal to fly higher, and one uh, didn't know that, probably. That's my assumption. OK, so filing flight plan. Uh, probably a few of you already has, has already done that. I do it uh, any time. Any, all the time when I go flying, also when I do some formal flying during the spring or summer. Uh, yeah, I fly the flight plan every time. And that's because if I go to another country, uh, then I uh, then the controllers already have my flight plan and there are no problems between transitions to, to another country. And yeah. So, and you get used to it. And also the, the ATC gets used to taking flight plans from uh, gliders and it's, it's not a problem to fly, file it. It takes five minutes. So I think it's worth to do it every time. And yeah, first thing you have to, to tell them it's that you are flying a glider so that they, don't, they know that you, you don't have an engine. Uh, and if you go to a flight uh, between multiple countries, it's you have to have at least one point in every country you intend to fly in. Uh, that's because uh, then if you have one point in that country, uh, then the control air traffic controller from that country receives your flight plan, and then they uh, they have all of your information, and it's, it's not a problem. It's happened to me once that I didn't do that, that I uh, I flew from the Dolinska region to Maribor and the straight line was through Croatia. And I thought that, yeah, the Croatians will get my flight plan, but they didn't. And they did, didn't let me in. And I I had to wait like 10 minutes to do it. So it's it's good thing to, to have at least one point in every country. And illegally, you have to... Uh, do it 
30 minutes before takeoff. Coordination with ATC, it's an important part and it's, it's really important to practice it before uh, because on flight like flight like this, you have to think about, about other things, and co coordination with ATC should be uh, almost uh, almost uh, you you, you shouldn't have to think about it a lot. Uh, yeah, and uh, it's you have to contact bef them before entering controlled airspace, of course, and it's a good thing to request a block of altitudes. For example, if you are flying be be between flight level 160 and 195, you just tell that you request a block between 165 and 195. Uh, so you don't have to tell them every time you, you descend or every time you climb. And uh, you just have to tell them if you get uh, out of this block or if you change the direction or anything like this. Uh, so, and if there is a situation that you weren't clear for, but you have to do it uh, because of there is like an emergency, or if you, if you have to go somewhere uh, because you have a lot of sync and they didn't give you the clearance, just tell them, uh, for example, uh, continuing with heading 150 due to uh, safety reasons or something like that, or due to weather. Uh, just just tell them so that they will know and they will coordinate you. You have a, a priority as a glider. Uh, so you, they have to uh, let you fly. And if you are not really familiar with coordination with ATC, it's, it's a great thing if you have something to write on uh, but if you get used to coordinating or com communicating, then uh, normally you, you are able to insert the squawk and the frequency in as they tell them, uh, as they tell you. So it's not that big of a problem. So soaring cross-country potential and future flight ideas from Postoina region. So here is the flight that we've done with Luca. We didn't uh, plan this flight, we planned just 1,000. And yeah, it's from Postoina to Lino two times. Easy flight. And the next one is out and return. It hasn't been done yet. And it's also on the waves. In It's a long flight. So uh, we will try to make it. And the next one is uh, that was Sandy's idea uh, is that you take off from Postoina, then go to Zadar or to this region and back on the waves. And then you, you go to the waves to the Alps. And then you try to go to Caravanke region, to, to Caravanke mountains, and from Caravanke to Maribor uh, on, on the slope flying low and then to through to to here to Brunico somewhere around here and back here then you try to find wave and come back to Pustoina. The problem here is that not always there is a strong uh, northern wind here when we fly on the waves. Last two times that we flew here, they weren't able to, to make good cross-country flights from Maribor or from Murska, Sobota or Ptui. So last two times we were flying there, it, it, war, it wasn't, this flight wasn't possible. So now I will present you the 1,300 kilometers flight we, we made with Luca. So yeah, here, Luca's name is missing. Uh, yeah. So. First, I will show you the where we flew and how we planned the flight. So we started to plan a flight uh, at a 1,000 kilometers flight. And firstly, we want to first we we wanted to start in Idoshina. Uh, I've started in Idoshina most of the times when I flew on waves, because and that's because uh, when you start when you uh, take off from Postoina, if you go to Aidoschina, here, if you don't find wave, there is a 
airport directly underneath you when you can land without a problem. And also here you can find waves much lower than elsewhere. That's, that's the first reason. Second reason to go to Aidoschina is because when you don't find any lift here, if there is a strong northern wind, uh, you, you don't have much problems with flying back to Postojna. And yeah, but it's better to go to Ilirska Bistrica because if you go here, uh, you can start on a wave which is continuing to the Bosnia or with just a few gaps between them. So if you start from Aidoschina, here you have a big gap you have to cross. And also in Aidoschina, you have to stay on the safe place for a time when you, when you fly, when you climb to higher altitudes. And it takes a lot of time. Uh, normally, you, you ta it takes you like an hour or more. And then you, you get here with like 4,000 meters and that's, that's too low. So yeah, we decided to start here because it's faster and we didn't need to stay on the same place. We just flew straight the, uh, next to the coast. And we set the first point in here next to Liuno. Like Liuno is here a, a little bit further. Second point here where the uh, wave normally ends. Third point here near Zadar. Uh, Abim Zadar, and the last point in Postojna. So, uh, yeah, let's go back to the presentation. Here is when we started. We started at 7.45. It was probably, we could start 20 minutes earlier, but we had to do some, we have to prepare the instrument and other things. So. Uh, yeah, but it, it wasn't so late start to be a problem. Uh, from Postovena airfield, here you have, you see that the sun just uh, has just risen. And we uh, caught a wave. Uh, we we uh, had an aerotow to 2300, no, it was lower, 2100 meters. And when we uh, when we disconnected from the tow plane, uh, we started our task and in like two kilometers, we found a wave which we uh, used to, to go to the coast. And we didn't, we, we just turned back one time and went back 500 meters and then further. So uh, we didn't lose any time there with climbing. And here you see when we, here is the start of, uh, here are the, in the, on the coast, a beam Rijeka. So here we came to a bit. You can see that there was uh, quite a lot of overcast on the, on the uh, land. And then we flew towards Luna. So when we came here, it, it looks like it's, we were on the moon and it's really a beautiful terrain here with snow and snow was to the, to the coast and it was really beautiful. Uh, there wasn't a lot of wind, so we could, flew, we could fly fast and a lot of times uh, we had to fly with, uh, with maximum speeds just to stay on under flight level one, nine or five. Uh, that we were clear to fly at. Uh, yeah, so here we came to, when we came to Zadar, uh, we had to cross a small gap, which was, which Sandy was showing before. And then we flew towards Dinara, uh, where we got waves again. Here is after our first turn point. Uh, we were here in approximately two hours and a half. And uh, as we turned back, on, we, we got some great waves again on Dinara. And we flew back, back to, to Slovenia. So I will show you 
how this uh, flight look, looked like. Here we took off from Postoina. Somewhere here we disconnected, we started our task, and then we flew to the coast and we were climbing all the, all the time. We had climb rates between one meter, two meters, and later on uh, we had climb rates with of three meters, four meters constantly. So we could fly with uh, maximum speed and still gaining altitude. Okay, so here we, here we are already on 5,000 meters. It was starting to get cold, but not too cold to fly it there. So here is Velebit. We flew next to Velebit. Bernard, what was the average wind speed? It was between 80 and 90 kilometers per hour. It, it wasn't a strong wind. Uh, so we could fly fast. So here, here is the third turn point. So we had to fly further down now. So here is the first gap when, where you have to fly from one wave to another wave. Because here the ridges are, uh, are not per perpendicular with the, with the wind. So there are no waves, almost no waves. So we had to cross this gap and then we came back to back to Dinara. Here the Dinara starts, here is Sin, and here on the on the other side, here is Sin, and on the other side is Luna. We flew uh, along the Dinara, still on altitudes of between 5,500 5, and 6,000 meters. And the next problem was that we put the turn point uh, in the region with no waves. So we had to uh, glide there and go back and we lost some altitudes and the, our average speed was lower. It wasn't 100, 160, but it was 150, so we were slower. And here was the next gap we had to cross. And here we were at 3,800 meters, which was quite low for this kind of flying. Uh, yeah, but the, the gap was quite big and I didn't find the perfect line for that. And also the sky side prediction uh, started to deviate from the actual, actual conditions. So uh, we couldn't rely on sky sets anymore. And we had to rely on our uh, experience and our flight path before from where we were coming from that direction. Okay, so let's continue with the presentation. So here the, the Dinara ends, and then here is Bushkolek, and here to the left is Luno. We had our turn point around somewhere around here, so you can imagine, or no, so somewhere around here. So here the wave ended, and we had to glide there, and then glide back, and we lost quite some altitude. And then we, we were on our way back. Here, somewhere here is Zadar, here is Knin, and there is a lake. And there was the gap here where we, where we are currently at, uh, the wave ended, and we had to fly to the valley bit to, to get another wave. So we were looking at the uh, lenticularis clouds, uh, they were from the secondary wave. So we weren't able to get to them. And this is the Pug Island, I think. Uh, we were, we are Abim Zadar here. And there is another beautiful photo of Kirk Island. You can see that there is a airport here. 
uh, it's commercial airport and I think it's possible to land there, but you could, you could have problems with big crosswinds uh, when you're flying in this kind of wind. So then we turned our second turn point and uh, we were heading back towards our third turn point. We were on, on time on our task uh, or even uh, a bit earlier. So we weren't concerned with that and the waves were great. Uh, even though the prediction for the later on uh, wasn't so good, uh, but we it, it turned out that it was better than predicted. So we had some luck. And then here, uh, after passing the Kirk Island, we saw this lenticularis cloud. At first, it looked like it's far away, but uh, then we came closer and closer, and we found out that it's from primary wave. So uh, I, I tried it out. And here we are on this lenticularis wave. It was spectacular, but it was just, it was the only lenticularis cloud we were on in the whole day. Otherwise, it was blue. And here uh, with this gap we, I was talking about earlier, uh, we went from, from Zadar to, uh, to Dinara uh, with the same path as before, but the wind has changed, uh, changed and that's why we came there lower. And also Dinara didn't work as well as we thought it would. So uh, we wanted to get some waves here, great waves, but we didn't get them. So we went further and further just to find them. And after we uh, saw that there are no waves as before, we turned back and used some, uh, some not as strong waves uh, to climb a bit higher. So when we came to Dinara, we were at three, we were at 3,800 meters. And when we, uh, we when, when we crossed back to Zadar, we were a bit higher, I think about 5,000 meters. So uh, here is, let me show you the, where we were flying. Here we came back to wave again. As you see here, we were climbing with three and a half meters. And now we are at 6,000 meters again on very bit. Flying with two, 210 kilometers per hour. Uh, most of the time, because it's the, it's the maximum airspeed you're allowed to fly at, at this altitude. Okay, so here is the second front third point. And now we are headed towards Luna again. Here we are on the same wave again, but we didn't quite find the right direction. So uh, we lost some altitudes, but here uh, on very bit, we got back the altitude we wanted. And we are flying towards towards our first turn point. So somewhere here we were uh, we started to talk about the how we will continue the flight. We both agreed that the one thousand kilometers uh, flight is is of course possible, and we will be in Postoina too early. So we decided to go to Lino again, uh, even though the prediction for the wind was much worse than before. Uh, but yeah, we, we had a great airplane and we, have a, we had a possibility and uh, we wanted to have some adrenaline, not just the sure way. So we went there again. So here is the uh, the gap again, we are back to 3,700 meters. 
for us it was it was quite low and here we turned once because we wanted to gain altitude but we are not much higher uh, here we were much lower but it was also nice because the temperatures were quite nicer uh, the temperatures here were just around minus 25 so it wasn't cold anymore and we turned back when we saw that we won't find great waves again also here we saw that the wind in the lower uh, sections has changed uh, its direction completely so there were no good uh, conditions for wave flying so we crossed this gap again we managed to find a better way so we didn't lose as much altitude and here we were on 4500 meters again and flying back on valley bit along the valley bit back on 5800 meters and here the controllers has has changed so there was a nice controller which probably probably didn't know the legal requirement to stay under flight level 195 and she let us fly higher so there we were at 6300 meters here we went to finish our task we finished task with around 120 kilometers per hour because we did 200 kilometers more when we deviated from task we had 165 kilometers per hour so we were quite fast and here we are on final glide to land in Postoina. And here we were on 1,300 kilometer mark. So back to presentation. We decided that we are uh, we are too fast in Postoina, so we went further on to Gorica. Uh, just to have some more kilometers and because there was still uh, a daylight and we e even didn't use the, the whole day uh, we could land like 15 minutes uh, later on but uh, yeah it was enough for us so here is uh, Molfancone and here on the left is Thirst and that's Italian Sea here on the right is Gorica. And that's on final glide. You can see some lenticularis clouds forming there again. And here is Nanos. And sunset from the glider. It was quite nice, but cold. And I really had to pee. <laughs> so yeah, that's after, after landing we got a nice bottle from our uh, pilot, Bostian. Uh, he came to airport to, to see the landing. And now here we have the video. Uh, so is it possible, Alberto, to, to uh, watch the video? Or someone with great Wi-Fi? Si, eh, si è possibile, devi, uh, uh, yes, it's possible. When you share the video, you have to check, to flag the two uh, checkbox of, uh, at the bottom, of the bottom. So that means for the audio and for the, for the video. If you, if, uh -huh. you, if, you, if you click share video, then you can see two uh, checkbox. Oh, so where when you choose I... the video. Where do I share the video? Yeah, when you when you uh, when you push the green button, uh, share video, share uh, share screen. Yeah. Okay. You you can see when you choose the document, you can see two flag box. Yeah, share sound and optimize for exactly. Video and the and the second suggestion I give you is to 
um, make the the window the windows uh, smaller. Uh huh. Because okay. Because otherwise, it's too much uh, information, too too much too much uh, too heavy. Okay. Okay. Uh, so can okay. you see the the video right now? Yes. Okay, great. Let's play it. Well, that was amazing. Yeah, it, it's a uh, Sandy put a great video together. Uh, thank you again, Sandy, for doing this. So, somebody said goosebumps. Yeah, I I also have them. <laughs> great. And here I would like to thank Luca for letting me fly with him with his amazing airplane. And yeah, and. Thank you for your time. And I think it's time for the questions. Well, first question I've seen was, did you fly with any water ballast or maybe uh, trim ballast in the tail? Oh, no, we didn't have any water ballast as the water would freeze at those temperatures. Sure. Uh, so it's we, we couldn't do it, but no it would ballast. be really helpful. Good. I see many, many congratulations on the chat line. Uh, and it was, uh, it was a great presentation for everyone, I see. Oh, thank you. Uh, so thank you very much, Bernard and Sandy. 
We have been answering some questions uh, and answered during your presentation. So there were some. Uh, somebody asked, uh, Aldo, somebody asked about technically, uh, did you have a hard time uh, uh, going to the, to the bathroom? Did you bring, how, what, did, what kind of system did you use uh, for, to do number one, uh, to do oh. PP? Yeah, uh, Luca uh, had that figured out, but I didn't uh, because I, yeah, I, I didn't need it until just the, the last uh, half an hour. So I didn't. Yeah, you are, you are the youngest, you see. You don't need <laughs> oxygen, you don't need a bag. You're lucky. <laughs> yeah, but I think you, you use the condoms to, to do it normally. Uh, yeah. But it's it's hard to do it because you have so much clothes on. Yeah, that's that may, makes everything very complicated. I, I heard you say you use ten layers of um, of fabric. Yeah, uh, two 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 jackets for skin and a lot of other layers beneath. So I I was really uh, yeah I had a lot of clothes. One longer question by Yannick is how was your strategy for a possible outlanding or fields in the wild area with the strong bora in the Velebit channel? And then also, uh, well, I think you already answered about the collaboration with the Croatian air traffic controllers. Was it easy to get the clearances? Yeah, uh, we got all the clearances we wanted. And also on this flight, uh, they they let us stay on the same frequency for for the most of the time. We just, we changed like 10 or 12 frequencies during the, the whole flying, which is just amazing. They collaborated the whole time. And uh, because on the previous flights, I had to change like 15, 20 frequencies in, in shorter period of time so here they were amazing and also knew about the flying and were really helpful so very well and yeah. about the possible outlanding i think you were only essentially you were, were only considering the international airports on the islands and on the coast yeah so uh, here we were considering flying to grobnik and also when I was flying with one seater before with the DG100, I always just rely, relied on Grobnik and mm -hmm. Zadar See? and maybe Kirk, but that was just a last resort. Here Grobnik was and Zadar were primary. And here Luno and Sin. Those were the, the main uh, landing possibilities. Yeah. Uh, yeah, when yeah. I flew with one seater, I flew to here and I was at 8,000 meters so I could reach the Grovnik and it was uh, it was just not enough altitude. So you really have to be careful here. Bernard, I think yeah. you should mention also Loshin. Yeah, it's uh, here, Mali Loshin. Here is a uh, airport international. It's, uh, yeah, it's a great runway you have to uh, glide 45 kilometers from here from the coast uh, but yeah sandy said that it's you shouldn't be relying on it because there are quite strong crosswinds but i think for the last resort it's it's also okay uh, yeah i think those are the yeah, i've the, seen maybe the, maybe it's an island quite far into the sea yeah Yes. Yeah, but uh, maybe we we should stress out uh, two different uh, maybe situations we have. Uh, if we go for an outlanding, let's say we have some technical problem with oxygen and so on, and we are um, confident on the wave, I think the better choice would be to go to mainland. Um, so seeing, and we we have picked some outlandings that we will work on it um try to 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 go there and see how how this uh, it's landable in these conditions and there are a lot of uh, candidates on the mainland and the other the other um the other let's say situation is that you get low uh, at the transitions 
So I mentioned before the main, um, this um, international airfields. I think lotion is a possibility um, when you, let's say you get uh, washed out from the wave. So you get, uh, you get with the wind, um, it's far away, but you have to know that you are, um, you are going uh, with the wind, which is quite strong, but it's a last resort landing. Um, you have to know that borrowing has quite uh, strong gusts. It depends also the, um, from the situation. Luca and Bernard didn't have so much strong wind. So I think uh, it would be easily landable. It was quite different situation for me and Bustian. I think it will be quite uh, challenging uh, landing. So depends on the on the on the situation you have um, and uh, and the decision um, could could be could and have to be chosen wisely. I, I see there are three more questions. Quite interesting. Do you use electric heated clothing or boots? Maybe. Oh no, we didn't use them. I, I tried to use those kind of clothes before, but the problem is that the batteries die so fast that it's it's not really a good choice because of the the cold but if you had bigger batteries i think it would be okay but for me uh, I but think... in, the, in this glider you have a big a big battery very big <laughs> yes i think luca should answer this question yeah the other question was about the fast batteries did they fare well given the very low temperatures so this was the first flight where uh, battery temperature dropped below zero. So on all other flights, you know, in the Alps, flying 10 hours uh, on the north wind, I saw minimum temperature like uh, four degrees. But during this flight, it dropped down to minus four. So... Uh, do you think really they get... They, uh, Luca, do you think they get damaged? Do you risk... Uh, to have permanent damage for this kind of batteries if it goes uh, close to zero? No, no. We could we could use it uh, down to minus 10 degrees. So, of course, at uh, such low temperature, uh, we, we could not get uh, uh, maximum power. Uh, so, basically, we would use it, let's say, for a shallow climb or ideally just for level flight uh, when it would be required. Uh, but then after usage, after, let's say, 10-15 uh, minutes of uh, level flight, the temperature would, start, would uh, slowly rising up. And uh, so, but in such uh, cold conditions, uh, uh, we could hardly expect uh, like, uh, you know, uh, two meters climb or something. So it's impossible. So you can climb maximum maybe with one meter per second. So uh with such cold temperature of batteries but anyway it's we put them in the glider uh in the morning so they were uh, during the the night before the batteries were uh, recharged uh, uh, at uh, room temperature so they were they were uh, warm but anyway uh, with such low temperature i think uh, this uh indication uh, of temperature, which is uh, in Schempheer Glider's analog indication, was most of the time showing uh, minus 30. So uh, it was really extremely cold, so. Uh, I have a question for Sandy and, and Bernard. Uh, the question is referring to something you said uh, to our previous, um, when we were doing a trial presentation, you mentioned something very interesting. That you noticed that uh, flying at 6,000 uh, meters was really not necessary, and you calculated a 4,500 would be a faster average, would give you um, a better result in the end. Can you confirm that? That uh, you maybe you, you were trying to be precautious to fly too high, and that instead, if you fly a little bit lower, you get a better speed at the end. Yes, yeah. I can elaborate that. Uh, when uh, myself and Bustian did the flight, it was uh, we were quite um, risk averse and we were flying really high. And when I ended the flight, uh, Andre Kolar, uh, so um, you know you know him because uh, of uh, Naviter and uh, CU 
and um, OD called me and said, Sandy, you could easily do 1,200 uh, kilometers, but you were flying too high and you did the transitions too high. And that's why, because uh, if you are too high, the, the wind is speeding up and you have at the higher level, you have quite strong wind. And if you have quite strong wind, the, the, the ground speed is uh, it's, uh, it's lower. Uh, and in, this is the way flying, uh, cross-country wet flying is a balance of, uh, of the height and speed. If you are lower, you have more ground speed. If you're higher, you have uh, less ground speed. And because of the first, but it, it's, it, 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 there were quite different conditions if you compare the two flights and the most uh, the most uh, pronounced uh, difference was that uh, uh, me and Bostian had 140 kilometers to 150 kilometers uh, per hour wind speed at that levels. So, and uh, Luca and Bernard has had, had uh, half of that. And yes, you have to optimize your transitions. You have to optimize uh, your, your speed. With the with the height, so if you are high, you will go you will go slower. Yeah, but I think when we me and Luca flew, uh, it was best better option to fly higher because the wind speed wasn't so so great. So uh, I think we were we had optimal uh, heights. I would agree. Yeah. <clears throat> Any more <clears throat> questions? I see somebody's writing something. Or... Any issues with the glider page deterioration, uh, deteriorating under these extremely low temperatures? So this glider is uh, painted with uh, polyurethane paint, so which is not so uh, critical. So so far we did not saw any, uh, you know, any signs of this flying on the glider so i don't think it's a problem and also on older gliders we we didn't see any major cracks or anything like this and we were we, we, we we've done uh, quite a few flights with with them with uh, long duration and low temperatures there's a technical question by bruce duncan he says um, the best LD, the glide ratio of the glider, is at the same indicated airspeed. Oh, yeah, that, different that's different altitudes. And so as at higher altitude, you have more wind, which is which is better. Oh, is it I a think... complicated calculation? Which is more convenient for uh, actually, the the LD uh, is the same at the same uh, indicated airspeed. Uh, it's it's not higher. Uh, yeah. The same indicated airspeed, which is a higher true airspeed. If you are, yeah. happy. but then you have more wind, and probably you get slower for that. So how how do you try to make the decision between flying lower or higher, or is it just that you accept the situation you're in. Also, the thing is, if you are higher, you are more conf confident to fly faster because if you are low and you fly too fast, you are quickly on the ground. You have more mar margin and uh, that's why also it's, it's good to fly a bit higher than the, the optimum. Uh, because you don't have to slow down as much when you have to cross a gap or something like that. Uh, but 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 the critical, the most critical part, from my perspective, was uh, ending the the wave from let's say Velebit and then transitioning to Knin into the wind. And if you are too high, you have quite um, quite uh, quite an angle to the wind, and your ground speed is like. 30 to 40 kilometers per hour if you are too high. And that's the problem. You are losing a lot of time there. Uh, so for the transitioning, it's really about the balance, uh, how, to, how to transition and on, on which level with, uh, and you have to balance safety margin 
Um, and this is something that we we should tackle. Uh, this issue is really important for, for long cross-country flying. Maybe it was more pronounced for my flight but with, with Bustian because the wind was so high. Uh, and it's less pronounced, um, let's say, challenge to make the, the, the optimal flight for lower winds. Um, but for sure, we were uh, quite, um, it was, it was um, let's say, an agony going from uh, Velebit to Knin, doing the transition and go, uh, looking at the ground speed. It was, uh, like I said, really low. So that's why it's, it's better to go with lower altitude, uh, not exaggerating because we were exaggerating because we were risk uh, averse and we were just, uh, just enjoying the flight. We were not going for the, for the long, uh, long, long cross-country flight. We were more uh, keen to explore the, the region and, uh, and the possibilities. But yeah, this, this is um, some, something that we should, let's say, a little bit uh, analyze it and elaborate it for the future flights. Uh, Sandy, Jean-Marie. Yes, Jean you, sh you should read again the chapter nine of my book because so, the, the solutions of these equations are in chapter nine. I, I know that, Jean, but um, I, I, will, I, will, I will buy your book because uh, no, you must read Bernard, Bernard, is reading, this, Bernard is reading too long. Still, still, <laughs> it takes too long. <laughs> you want not to buy it, a take from Luca. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. I will buy it for sure. No, but uh, the, the solutions are there and we know, I know what I know. to do. But it, it depends very much on the decreasing of the V and E with the altitude of your glider. That's I also don't... important, yeah. Yes, and I don't know I don't know the duo, but uh, I know the Nimbus very well. I flew three thousand hours in in wave. And yeah, on duo, on duo, I think at six thousand meters we were limited to two hundred fifty kilometers yeah. uh, indicated. But at what at which altitude does the, uh, the, the the speed is starting to decrease? It's about uh, three thousand, four thousand. You already need to take care about mm -hmm. so. Uh, Yes, it would, would be, be really, the same for me. It so, would be really nice if we could fly faster there, of course, but it's uh, technical limitations. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, was, you I, was looking, I was looking at the table at, at the side of the should, glider. You should take my, my Nimbus is limited to at 260, indicated at 6,000 meters. Yes, we would gladly take it. Yes, you take it. <laughs> sure. For sale. I'm selling it because I'm I'm retiring. I'm I, I'm stop I stop flying because uh, for some reasons. Crazy. But uh, this this is the real glider for for this kind of flight. Yeah, yes, dear indeed. friends, dear friends. I'm sorry, but it's it's now quite late. Okay, twenty minutes past eleven, and uh, some participants have left us. On, only about twenty of them. So it was a big success. I can see greetings from California, greetings from other and other states in the USA, greetings from you all over Europe. I am amazed. It was a fantastic, fantastic evening. Thank you very much. Uh, I think Pierre Fassina, Pierre Fax, uh, as the organizer of the meeting with uh, Bolo Vela Nordest, uh, Charlie Victor November Echo, wants to say something. Thank yes, you very yes. much. Greetings from Vienna. It was it was great. Thank you very much. Pierre. Yes, thank Andrew, you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I, I'm very impressed about this presentation, and I want uh, I want to thank uh, our friend, our three friends, for the professional presentation of this webinar, and to answer to all these questions. I also, of course, I want to thank Jean Marie for his speech about oxygen management, we will treasure it. Uh, I just want, uh, uh, I, I just want to rem uh, remind everybody uh, the book of Jean-Marie, Dance with the Wind, which is very interesting. And soon as Jean-Marie says, is uh, soon will be available also in Italian, thanks to some willing pilots and the uh, kindness of Jean-Marie, of course. Thank, of course, to Aldo, for having a moderation of this evening in, in, in a great manner. Also thank to Acao and also to Alberto Sironi 
contribute as usual to the to the realization of this event. And thank you pleasure to all my friends with work with me with in, in the shadow. And uh, I just want to to leave you with uh, with a video for to remember the the evening of 21 of February at 21 o'clock Italian time, same link with the, the solar glider and Eric. That, that's it for me is everything. I thank again uh, our friend and all of you to, to stay with us so a long time. I share the video and we I say everybody for the next. Grazie Pierre, è stato un grazie, piacere. Pierre. Grazie Andrea, grazie Ciao. Alberto Sironi. Thank you. Ciao. 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 Grazie, congratulazioni. Ciao, c'è un video. Ciao. Ciao. Grazie. Il video conclusivo, the closing video. Ah, that's Eric Raymond. The Sun Seeker, me and the Airfax, we have both been flying over this fantastic machine. It was a privilege. February the 21st, solar flight experience with Eric Raymond. Good night, everyone. Ciao tutti. Ciao. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Bernard. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Ciao. Thank you, thank you for hosting. Bye. Ciao, 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 ciao. Congratulations.